Saint Melk is not typical of all monasteries for many reasons. First, it is very grand, which most, especially later foundations, aren't. Secondly, it was founded in the countryside, whereas in the 17th and 18th centuries, a good proportion of foundations were made in towns. Thirdly, it still owns a substantial amount of land, because fourthly, it lies in the Austrian Republic, the only European country where grand old monasteries have been in continuous existence since they were founded, 900, 1,000, even in one case 1,200 years ago. I had been writing nonfiction for years, actually, and but secretly wanting to be a novelist. When I first started writing at the age of 30, it was with the intention of writing fiction. But I took a little detour um, for 10 or 12 years and wrote nonfiction, which I have absolutely no regret about at all. I think it was exactly the right thing for me to do. But there was that dream tucked away inside of me to do this. And I remember reading something that Eudora Welty wrote, who is, you know, the great novelist from Mississippi who had a big influence on me, actually. She said, no art ever came out of not risking your neck. And I think she's absolutely right about that. It felt that way to me at the time, and actually it feels that way to me every time I sit down to write something. Finally, in the early 90s, I took my deep breath and started writing fiction. It felt risky to me at the time to do that. And one of the very first things that I wrote was what I thought was going to be the first chapter of a novel called The Secret Life of Bees. I wrote it in 1992, and it is actually essentially the first chapter of the novel, as it is now. Sea creatures are inspiring the latest devices that harness wave power. This one, called the oyster, sits on the ocean floor and opens and closes as waves pass over it. Cables attach it to generators on the shore. Since November 2009, it's been powering 9,000 homes in the Orkney Islands. Another device looks like a snake. The anaconda is made from a rubber tube filled with water that floats just below the surface. When a swell hits the front of it, the tube is squeezed. A bulge ripples down its length and powers a turbine in its tail. Prototypes are currently being tested, but the full-scale version will be 200 meters long. This system also looks like a snake, but this one is made of steel. It floats near the surface, where waves make its joints move. This drives hydraulic systems that power electrical generators. Like the Anaconda, it's still being tested. Results will prove if these devices are up to the job of supplying viable sources of green energy. This busy little town is named after St David's first cousin. It's also a Welsh language stronghold. According to the 2001 census results, 70% of the town's population could speak Welsh. But even here, the language may not be completely safe. The Welsh Language Board expects last year's census results to show a fall in the number of Welsh speakers living in its northern and western heartlands. One of the main reasons for that, the board says, is migration. Many Welsh speakers are choosing to leave the country. At the same time, only a small percentage of those moving in can speak the language or choose to learn it. Historically, over the past 70, 80 years, Welsh people have continually left in order to find better, better standard of pay, maybe, and quality of uh, employment. Uh, the thing that's changed most probably is that um, there is a larger amount of English people now who have found Wales over the last 20, 25 years, particularly this corner of Wales, and uh, regard it as a desirable place to come and live, and as opposed to many areas of England, I suppose, like the Cotswolds, cheaper as well. I marvelled at how often powerful feel powerless, but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organisations which, which seek to share wealth and opportunities, which seek to protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. 
According to the UN, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of the last century. Sorry, since the turn of yeah, last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion. There are 700,000 not-for-profit organisations in Australia alone. 700,000. The UN recognises 37,000 specifically civil society organisations across the globe working in international relief and gives accreditation to many of them. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a growth in trust. The third sector, NGOs. Putnam, who discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. 